Good day, everyone. Today I have with me Paul Veldman, all the way from Victoria. You based in Melbourne, is that correct? Based in Melbourne, yes. Based in Melbourne, and Paul is from Cando Martial Arts, and Paul has been in the industry a long time. And it's it's funny enough, as I was researching of people I can interview, a lot of people said I'm being mentored by Paul Veldman, and that's kind of how I got knocking on Paul's door, and I thought I'd. I'd like to get him on the show and get him to share all the all his uh, industry experience and knowledge with us. So, welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks, George. Good to be here. Awesome. So, I guess to start back right at the beginning, how did you get into martial arts and what's sort of your background story? Uh, martial arts training, I probably started when I was around about 13 years old and there, there was no real reason I wasn't bullied. I, I had a, a nice stable um, house and home. Uh, just something I, I thought I might like to do. Um, spoke to mum. Mum said, yep, you can do martial arts and I'll pay the fees, but you've got to find somewhere you can walk to because I'm working and these are the jobs you've got to do around the house to make up your fees. So back then, 30 years ago, there was a, a judo club or a, um, a freestyle karate club in walking distance and that was, that was the choice. So I, I went with freestyle karate and you know, been training ever since. All right, awesome. So at, at what point, now you were also in the police force, were you? Yeah, and that was actually really, um, I guess, the, the tipping point as to why I did a club. So I trained as, as a kid in the freestyle karate. Uh, I went into traditional karate um, in the Shukakai stream and training with my instructor. You know, as when we're all younger, young and fit and having a great time training that two or three classes a day, a few, few days a week. Um, and then in conjunction with that, I was going to have a, a crack at our special operations group in the police force. Um, and, and in training for I blew my knee out. So I had a full knee reconstruction and I went from training five, six days a week with my instructor, training at my workplace, training at the gym to answering phone in, phones in a room with no windows. And so, you know, as you can understand, stir crazy. So I went yeah. down to my sensei, sensei Kurt Klimkite, and said, I am going nuts here. Can I come and help out on the mats? And he said, yeah, sure, come on down, help the kids' classes. So um, there I am in my, my knee brace and my crutches, hobbling around and, you know, I got off the crutches and then he says to me one day, why don't you open up a club? There's a place down the road. And I went, oh, yeah, how hard could it be to run a business in a martial arts club? <laughs> so for the next 10 years, we, um, we ran it very, very, very badly as far as the business side went. You know, we, we, we taught what we knew. We didn't market. We didn't advertise. We didn't know anything of that. Uh, I worked full time in the police force. I worked six days a week in the club. You know, we, we had a young family. Uh, and we went through burnout phases really regularly. And then it was, I can't remember, maybe maybe 10 years ago now, the first martial arts super show was running Queensland. And the first martial arts business seminar I ever went to was with a bloke called Roland Osborne. And the first thing he said to me, you know, he said to the class was, everybody will leave you in your school. Everybody who's there now will leave you. They might leave in 30 years' time when they have, you know, fall off the perch or they may turn around and quit tomorrow. So... Enjoy it, make the most of the time you have with them, but don't let it become personal when they go. And, and that really resonated with me because I just lost I had one guy helping me out and he got a promotion at work and he left. And I was back to running the club by myself after, you know, after eight years of running it. And I was just in total burnout stage. And so it was then that we realized, well, you know what, there's, there's so much more to the industry than just you know, learning how to throw a punch and a kick. And we might be black belts in, in what we're doing on the mats in whatever style we're doing. But boy, we're, we're a white belt or less in, in the administration and business side of things. And so that's when we discovered, well, if we're going to do this, let's do it properly. You know, let's reach more people. Let's do it well. Let's, um, let's give the people the same goals and career opportunities we've had. And so we started getting some business mentoring. <coughs> Excuse me. We started looking into the subscriptions around, which, which back in those days were very American. Um, but it was the turning point. It was a real tipping point for us. Okay, so two things I want to I want to hop I want to get back to the American versus Australian systems and, and how you've adapted that. But going back, you said your first ten years, you guys sort of run it badly. What what were the sort of core mistakes that you were making at that time? I think, especially in the first couple of years, you try to be everything to everyone. You know, you'd have someone come in, and we were a Shukakai karate base, but with what I was doing in the police force, we were starting to blend some Brazilian jiu-jitsu, some, some Filipino martial arts. So you'd have somebody come in and say, do you guys do kata? And we'd say, yeah, absolutely we do kata. We're Shukakai. And you have someone else come in and say, I want to do sparring, but I'm a bit scared. Do you do, do, you do non-contact? And we say, we can do non-contact. 
the next bloke to come in and go, I want to get on the mats and, and punch on and do full contact. And you go, we can do full contact. And, and you make a little note to yourself that it looks like I'm sparring with this guy most of the time. <laughs> so we, we didn't really know what our target demographic was. You know, we ran classes that we enjoyed. And, and to be honest, that's still the, the basis of our club today. I enjoy the traditional karate, the values, the strength of the style. Um, I, I enjoy, although not very good at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I enjoy the Filipino martial arts. So that's what our styles evolved into. But we're a lot clearer now on who we want training with us. You know, we don't want the, the knuckle dragger who's going to come in and hurt people who want to be a professional fighter because we, we can't cater for them. So identifying who our, who our ideal customer was, was really looking at, well, who do I want to train with? Who, who's my perfect training buddy? And that evolved into, well, who's the best customer for what we offer? And so if someone comes in who, whose wants don't suit what we have, then we're really happy to recommend them to a couple of clubs nearby. There's a couple of really good mixed martial arts clubs. There's a couple of smaller clubs that are maybe a little bit cheaper than us and who are, I guess, less full-time. And to be honest, I, I'm more than happy as long as someone's training. I think that's great. You know, if they train with me, that's, that's fantastic. But I would rather have someone not join me and go to another martial arts club and not try at all for sure okay so and that, i guess that solves a lot of problems when you define exactly who you we got a we got a bit of a feedback there i think it's okay now yeah <laughs> so yeah so, so really defining who that who that audience is that you can sort of zone in with your market and it's something that came up in the interview yesterday as well so so moving on from that now you mentioned you learned from the American systems and uh, I've worked in America for, for a long time and um, I had a shell shock when I came to a South African going to America coming to Australia it was this yeah <laughs> it, it was it was weird in uh, adapting myself into those different styles now you mentioned that you learned a lot from the American way of, of doing things H how did you take that and apply it to into the Australian market without becoming too Americanized as such yeah, look, our first package, I guess, we, we joined up with was the Maya package. Um, and what it gave us, it started to give us structure. It started to say, well, look, have a plan because I think I'd run my club for nearly two years and nearly closed the doors before I put a pamphlet out. You know, the old adage of build it and they will come. Build it and they'll come if they know about you. So, um, <laughs> so we found with the American marketing, it was one, it was all there was. You know, there, there was nothing we local back then. Um, and so it gave us a structure. It gave us things like um, you know, marketing for a season or a reason. So when Father's Day came around, the Father's Day workout, New Year's, spring specials, and it tied in with, well, that makes sense. Now, their, their seasons might be opposite us, so the package we're getting is no good for now, but it gave us an idea. It gave us an idea of making things colorful, you know, not just putting a, a sign in the window. Um, but then, you know, the, the, the artwork was never for the Australian market. It, it doesn't. They don't look like Australians. You know, we're, well, I know we're all relatively similar on the outside, but that artwork looked very American. You know, the the, the Mother's Day or Thank Mum M O M never translated. Um, but it gave us a start. It gave us a bit of a an, an idea of what was happening. Um, you know, the yeah, first guy I met when I know was a chap called Keith Scott, uh, fantastic little Texan. He's he's just a wealth of knowledge and, and a guy who shares everything. And he'd come out to Australia a couple of times. And so he, yeah, we started to bring him around to the Australian way a little bit. And he would help tweak things. You know, he came and did a two day assessment of the school where he stayed with us for two days. You know, he came to the school, sat in there through all the classes, all the instructor meetings, et cetera, um, and got a bit of a feel for the difference. And I guess, you know, we, we made those mistakes through trial and error. Some ads worked, some ads didn't work. You know, and it was a little bit of a shotgun effect where we'd, we'd throw everything out there. And the ones that came back, We'd run with that more, so we gradually fine tune things. Uh, and we, should, you know, nowadays with Facebook and social media, that's that's a massive part of it that we're we're still even getting our head around. Yeah, well, one thing you you, you brought up there, and, and this is a uh, something key that that we try and teach with, um, if if you're doing social media and stuff yourself, it's a uh, the 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 easiest way to do things and to really get traction is really just pay attention. Um, you had a name for it, season for reason, I think it was. Yeah, market for a season or a reason. Yes, yes, um, and and that's such a it's such an easy way to get traction in social media because when you're talking about what's already being talked about and you can tie that into your own marketing, it's it's auto, automatically people are paying paying attention. They're already paying attention to the Father's Day, so 
piggyback on that promotion that's already happening and then make that your marketing as such. Yes. Okay, cool. So, so now at, at what point, now you've gone, how many locations do you have at this point in time? The three locations, um, the main ones in, in a place called Hughesdale. Uh, we run, I think we're sitting around 670, 680 students out of that one. Uh, we've got another one that's two years old as of yesterday. They're sitting around 250 students and we've got one that's six months old and they're about 80 students. Okay, wow. So now let's, let's, let's go back to how, how did this all evolve? At what point did you decide you were ready to branch out and, and go for that number two? <laughs> um, wow. You know, I, I guess with the with working through the police force as well, I gave up the police force about six, seven years ago, um, not because I didn't love what I was doing, but because it, it just came time to jump one way or the other. You know, I was finding I wasn't really doing anything properly. I was half doing the club, half doing the, the police force. Um, and so when I went full time with the club, it gave me so much more opportunity to develop not just the style not all the students, but the instructors. I mean, that was one of the key points um, in, after, the, after that first mentoring was to understand that you can't do everything by yourself. And you've, you've got to build your team and your team might be your guys on the mats, your guys on the desk, it might be your accountant, your solicitor, but your depth of your team has to be there. So, you know, I'm very lucky that I've got and still with me now, I've got some really good young guys that started with me as kids that were now in their mid-twenties. Um, and I had always earmarked an area as a demographic I lived in. I thought this would be a great club one day. And a couple of the young guys had talked about running clubs and one day you know, James came in and said, I, I know you've always said you'll do this area, but I wouldn't mind starting something. What do you think? I said, oh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not in a position to do it, so we could do that. What do you think we do a partnership? And he said, oh, what does that involve? I said, I've got no idea at all. We, I just made it up then. <laughs> so we, we formed this idea of a partnership, um, which, which is an interesting demographic. You know, like I said, James has been with me since he was five years old, and he's now an extremely competent 23-year-old instructor, practitioner. Um, and so we sort of went, well, let's just do it. And the stars aligned to a certain extent. And I think it's like anything. If you need, if you've got 10 things on your checklist that you want to have happen before you proceed with something, you know, good luck if you get six or seven. So were we prepped in some areas? Yeah, absolutely. You know, James is a fantastic instructor. A premises came up really quickly, um, which was unusual down there. So we thought, let's just jump at this. Areas we, that we could have worked more on if we had more time was the admin side of things, training him up on the business side of the club. But we hit the ground running and we, you know, we had some teething problems. Um, we fixed things as we needed to go. And as long as the, the face of what was happening to the students, to the customers, was okay, you know, the behind the scenes stuff, we, we scrambled where we had to scramble. So it wasn't really an expansion plan as such. It's just that we had such great success here. And the guys who had helped me make this place so successful um, by taking classes and, and being such great instructors saw it as a, as a, as a genuine lifestyle choice. Um, and so we thought, well, why not? You know, it's, it's not your traditional, you know, I guess, career path. But we know that financially it can be rewarding and, and even more so rewarding in the way that you interact with people to what you can do. So the, the plan to expand was never, I think I want to open up two or three clubs. And one of my business mentors, Fred De Palma, says, when, when you think about opening up your, your second and third club, don't. Because <laughs> the headaches do come. But, you know, there are, like I said, they get to a certain critical mass and then things start to come together. The clubs support each other. Um, you bounce ideas off each other. So, yeah, so I guess to answer it, I'd never plan on opening multiple schools, but we have a, a really good instructor development program where we almost develop the instructors to the point where if we don't let them go out under us, they'll go out on their own anyway. So, so what, is, what does that involve? I'll probably skip the step as well because um, you, were, you were still, so you were balancing your, your, your full-time job and then the school part-time. Yes. And then... So you went full time with the school first, and then opened the second one. No, um, I'd, I'd run the school six days a week from the day I opened it. Okay. This, this was just again not knowing what to do. My instructor ran his school six time, six days a week, so I did the same. I ran my school six days a week. Now I was also working a full time job. He wasn't. So that was um, probably mistake number one. Was, was too much. And doing that for multiple years with average working week was 80 hours plus was just crazy. You know, the kids paid a price, the family paid a price. So we, we don't do that anymore. Even the, even the new schools, although they're full time, only run four days a week. 
and we won't run more than four days a week until we get critical mass. So there was that. Okay. Okay, so, so you have this program then where you sort of groom the instructors. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, martial arts is, it's, yes, there's a, there's a very solid element of self-defense involved in our martial arts. Um, and my background, my street background with policing and so forth has really helped with that, what works, what doesn't work. But in this day and age, and especially in the demographic we, we live in our area, uh, personal development's a big thing. You know, um, and as, as you know, as most martial arts instructors know, the better you get, the less trouble you seem to get into physically. You don't, you don't have that need to, to get into a confrontation. You've got nothing to prove. Your awareness of what can happen both to you and from you is there. So we work very much on developing the kids and their confidence. Um, and so we, we start off what we call a leadership program. And the kids can join that at 10 years old. And that really simply, that involves them coming down to help one class a week. And then once a month, we do a leadership training hour. We'll cover things like uh, public speaking, um, how to break down teaching. And I tell you what, George, these kids are amazing. You know, they might be 10 or 11 years old, they're like sponges. They will get up and they'll explain to you the three attributes of teaching and what a good instructor should be like. So from there, when they hit that 14 years old, if they're really good, we put them on what we call a traineeship. And it's like an internship. So we're looking at them, you know, can this person get held down a job? So they come along for one night a week. Um, and we want to see if they can maintain their balance of, of training because that's first and foremost, they've got to be a student. Uh, if they can do that one night a week, they can maintain their homework because we really have to work with parents into this. At 15, if they've gone through that pretty well, we'll put them on as a part-time instructor um, and then they'd stay with us really up until most of them finish university. Oh, wow. Mm. Awesome. I, so I know- out of our main club, we'll, we've got in the vicinity of 50 to 60 leadership team um, and we run out of our 15 staff we've got three full-timers and the rest are, are part-timers or casuals who are students awesome yeah i i really see the value in that well, uh, my where my son trains they have the similar type leadership program i know he's been he's been talking about it for a few years and very much is what you've explained this whole progression and the whole like you say the public speaking and things like that i'd i'd almost argue that they get more value out of that from going to school because you see these kids these kids in martial arts and they're at this maturity level that you can't really compare with when you look at anybody else in their age group. And where do you where do you get an eleven year old these days who can stand up in front of a class of twenty kids, take charge and give clear instructions? It just doesn't happen. Yeah, it's it's invaluable I think it's probably the most unrated skill that mm. that confidence to be able to just present something in well, I mean they say public speaking is most people fear it more than death. <laughs> and I think, you know, you touch on there that's underrated. I think if people really knew the value of martial arts uh, and, and not just the punching and kicking, they'd be lined up around the block to join clubs. And I think as an industry, this is what we need to push across is the, the inherent value of what we do um, because, and, and I know this sounds cliche, but I really believe it. Our competition is not the bloke down the street with a different martial arts club. I, I don't lose students to other clubs. I lose students to basketball or football or cricket or whatever that, that team activity is. But as, as martial arts instructors, if we can teach parents especially, look, this is what your kids are good out of this. It's not about making them become thugs. You know, our industry will, will just get hotter and hotter. Do you use, do you use that in your marketing? Because, I mean, you've, you've hit the key point there. Like, that's the, I guess that's the ultimate. It's not the kicking. It's not the punching. That's that's really what the the kid is getting out of his martial arts training. Is there a way that you use that to communicate it to to a parent? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess I look at it two ways: one, what I talk to parents, and two, what I talk to people I mentor. Um, for parents, I, I say straight up: you know, we will teach your kids self defence, and we teach um, age specific and school appropriate. So we also you know, we give them tips on how to avoid bullies, etc., like, like a lot of clubs do. But as I say to the parent, what we're going to give your kid is more valuable than just being able to defend themselves if they're in a fight. We're, initially, we're going to teach them how to not get in the fight. We're going to teach them the environmental awareness. We're going to teach them uh, verbal skills. And we, you know, we've got some fantastic instructors who work with the young kids, and they're just, they're just guns. But the message they deliver is that it's not just about punching and kicking. There are life skills here. Uh, we've got a, a great mat chat book where every week there's a lesson. Now, the lesson might be on good manners or it might be when Anzac Day comes up, a bit of history. Um, and so we're trying to make these kids more and more well-rounded kids. And as I say to the parents, think about the last time your kid had a real fight. 
And they go, well, he hasn't yet. I said, great. Well, we want to maintain that track record um, with, with a few skills to back it up if need be. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about kids, but it's the same as the adults. When you sit down, in, especially in our area, and I say to the adults, when's the last time you had a real fight? I'd knock them down, stomp them in the head, poke them in the eye, fight. And, and most adults, 95% of them will go, never. So I say, good. So who's the enemy here? It's cholesterol and stress and, you know, not having something to do for yourself. So these are the triggers we use for our marketing because they're true. You know, as, you know I'm 45 years old and to find something for me when I'm not busy at work or I'm not busy with my kids or spending time at home working around the house, to find something that's my outlet is, is gold. Um, and that's why of our adult class, you know, uh, probably half of them are parents. Yeah. Um, and when we talk to business owners, we say, well, put a value on your punching and kicking. And, and, and again, you've got to, again, you've got to find your demographic we talked about at the start. Yes. Find your perfect market. If, if you're a, a, a fight school and you want to group fighters, then you're looking at a different market. But I say, you know, punching and kicking, man, that's worth 50, 60 bucks a month. I can get that anywhere. You add in a nice venues of that where the parents who are really your customers can come in, sit down, there's a coffee machine. It's, it's you know, maybe a bit warm in winter, a bit cooler in summer. Add another $30, $40 a month on. You then show the parents how you're going to develop their kids as people and you've got a good match app program or, or life skills program. Add another $30, $40 a month again. And so you're, const- you're constantly building value into what you're doing. And, and really, when you think about it, the worst, the worst quit you have is the email from the parent, little Johnny's quitting, please cancel our fees. The best quit you have is the parent ringing up and saying, little Johnny wants to quit. How can we stop him doing it? What can we do, what can we do yes. to do it? And how do you, how do you handle that? If, if a parent says, look, this is the situation, he wants to quit, what, what can you do? Um, we try to be proactive before. Uh, so what we look at, we look at training patterns. When, when the kids or even the adults come in and train, they have a card like the old punch card and they take it out of the rack, bring it into class and hand it to the instructor. Now, it's old-fashioned. We have databases and things as well. But what that does is it gives us a point of contact at the very start of the class. So we, we run a rule of three that every student in every class has to be encouraged and acknowledged at least three times. So the first one is, you know, g'day, George, how are you going? And I have, I have a look at your card. I flip it over and I can see your training pattern. And I saw that you were doing great guns at the start of the year. Media, you dropped off. In the last two months, I've barely seen you. So that's the, that's the indicator for the instructor to flag it yeah. with the parents before it happens, before they stop coming. Um, the instructors are okay to give out free private classes. So he's having, maybe he's having a bit of a problem with picking up a cart or a form or maybe he's taking a knock in sparring and his self-confidence is down. So we try to schedule just a quick chat with the parent or, and, and or student to say, hey, you're not training as much. What's going on? Is there something we can help with? Um, if we don't catch them before that and they do cancel out, now I should say we don't run contracts. I have nothing against contracts. We just don't do it because if you don't want to train with me, I don't want to keep you here. Uh, we do have a 30-day cancellation policy. They can train in, that th- in those 30 days. In those 30 days, what can we do to reverse it? You know, if The biggest thing is finding why. And bottom line is kids leave because they're bored. You know, sometimes they leave because they don't feel like they're making progress, but really they leave because they're bored. So we have to look for patterns in classes. We have to look at is it a certain class, a certain belt level, a certain instructor, and, and you know, we need to pay our due diligence there. Okay, excellent. So, so this is going to lead in great with retention because I, I think you're, you're really addressing this right now. It, it's a question of really paying attention to what's happening with your students. It's not like they just come in and then you in shock when a cancellation letter comes. You, you're actually in tune with that and, and watching for the patterns that might arise to address yes. them. So in expanding on that, what, what do you guys do to, to manage retention within the club? Wow. Now, now here's, a, <laughs> here's a, that piece of string. How long is it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's about being valued. You know, people, people want to be part of a tribe. Uh, I, I think people like to be part of, of a group, an organization where they feel valued. So I guess we can break it into two parts, on the mats, off the mats. So on the mats, like I said, you know, um, your staff have got to be good at highlighting and spotlighting, you know, highlighting on the go, recognizing someone's doing something well and just making a comment along the way or, or spotlighting when you actually stop the class and go, hey, show me that again. That was fantastic. So people feel recognized for the class they do. Um, Something as simple as a, as, a, as a high five or a fist bump for a kid. And, and again, if you've got a class of 40 people, you can't do it yourself. Your staff have to be able to do this. 
So systems, so acknowledged in class. They need to see progress. You know, this is why we have a belt system. Um, but And again, as you know, it's self-sourcing. If they're not training, they're not progressing, they're progressing, they're frustrated, they won't come to training. So you need to have a solid belt system where the goals are tangible for them. Uh, we have good job cards. Every kid in our club gets a good job card every term. Uh, and again, there's a spreadsheet where the instructors need to find something that they've done well. And it might be he, you know, he's mastered a kick. It might be his consistency in training. It might be just his general effort. But every 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 um, every shift, the instructors have to do three good job cards before they go home. And, and they write them like they mean it. And some of the good job cards are amazing. They, they're almost pieces of art. The, the instructors really believe what they say, which is important. So, you know, you and I, we get a letter in the mail. We open it up and go, well, how much is this going to cost me? A, a kid who's, you know, anywhere from four to 12 years old gets a letter and they're excited. And, you know, and my, my instructors recognise I did well in class and they've actually acknowledged it. Now, my, my three kids train. They've all trained since they're four years old. And even last year, my, my boys at 13 would get a good job card that would go up on the mirror even after all these years. So there's that, that acknowledgement. Um, we have birthday cards go out, whether it's their birthday or birthday week. We have um, little events, little retention events, where we'll do you know, pizza DVD nights, we'll run in-house tournaments. There's just a, a lot of things. I think what you've got to realise is there's no one quick fix. You know, you've got to have a, a system of, of retention in there. And, and interestingly, if you do some math, say an average $130 a month student, if you can save two students a month just by you know, showing some extra attention, um, you know, working some retention strategies, over two years, you, you're saving yourself $70,000. So it's not, it's not biggies we're talking about here. Plus that student who's left, he's not saying you know, fantastic things about your club necessarily. They're not referring people and they're not they're not with you. You know, you don't want to lose students because some of the students are there are just fantastic people. It, it actually hurts when you lose some of them. Yeah. All right, excellent. Awesome. I, I'm sure I could keep you going for hours. <laughs> but I've got two more questions for you. One, taking all this experience and knowledge that you have where you're at now, what would you do differently starting all over again? Wow. <laughs> oh okay. Um, I didn't have a why. I didn't have a why I wanted to open up my club. And, and these days, this is my main thing with someone who's an instructor is have a why. So I opened up my club because I was frustrated and bored. That's not a good enough why. I, I didn't have a goal of I want to help people. I want to generate income. I want this to take over my full-time job. So I would make my why a lot more solid because that would make it um, easier to focus on through the harder times. Um, and it would just keep me in tune. The second thing I would do is say get educated. You know, get it, especially these days. Now, we touched on it before. There's, there's so much marketing around. And when I started off, there was no internet. You know, there were no packages. No one was allowed to cross train to find different skills. It was very taboo not to, not to go to another club. So get educated. A acknowledge the fact that you might be the most phenomenal martial artist in the world. You might be a fantastic instructor. But if you don't know a, a Facebook boosted post from a newspaper ad, you've got no hope in building a club. Not in this day and age. It's too much competition. So treat yourself like a white belt. Um, I, I can't tell you how much the industry frustrates me that I'll get people who will spend $300 on a seminar to learn a, a spider guard technique or a new carter, but who won't spend $150 to go to a weekend business summit where they could put 20 new students on in the next month if they, if they pulled it out. So what I would do differently, I, I would start off slower. Um, I would educate myself in the, in the marketing and business side of things because dress it up how you want if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you know, you're running a business. And if you're not running a business, if you're in a school hall and you're charging $10 a, a class per person, then you're just not running your business very well. So that would be my two big things. Focus on my why, get educated earlier with the business administration side. Excellent. Paul, thanks a lot for your time. I, just lastly, if, I mean, you've got a vast of knowledge to share and, and so forth. If people want to learn more about you or from you, is there anywhere they can go or find out more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm really like, I'm very excited. A lady called Michelle Hex and I are launching a, um, an online mentoring program, Martial Arts Business Success. Um, that launches in October. So if you jump onto Facebook and have a look for that or myself or Michelle, um, Michelle is an absolute whiz on the Facebook and IT. Um, I'm reasonably dysfunctional with IT, but you know the, the strengths I have, we, we work very, very well with our 
our staff, our growing schools, our, our, our uh, retention. So it's going to be a great little partnership there. But have a look at that. Talk to people more successful than you. Yeah, you know, talk to people who have made the mistakes. And this is you know, like training. We were training martial arts so we don't have to go through the mistakes that the early guys made. Same with, with martial arts business. You know, hook into the, the, the Facebook groups. Go to the um, summit weekends and just get educated and start to build up your network of guys that share the same goals that you do. Because uh, as you know, you know, you, you get energy from these guys. You look at what they're doing and you're like, man, that's a, that's a good idea. And I, I'll let you on a little secret, and you and a couple of thousand of people who are going to watch this. All my best ideas are not my best ideas. <laughs> the 100 great ideas I've had in 20 years, probably three of them are original. And the other 97 I've gone from someone, that's good. I'm going to do that. And I might tweak it, but yeah. So, so get invested in, in your industry and get to know people who are like mine to you and, and just enjoy your journey. Excellent. That's awesome. Thanks a lot, Paul. And what I'll do is once your program is out, uh, for those people that are watching this or listening to this later, I'll make sure that the links are within the show notes so they can get access to you. All right, great. Thanks, George. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I'll chat to you soon. Cheers. See you later.